like to welcome you to um, the partnership with Wealthier Network and our homegrown members who have been dialing in. Um, opened a few weeks ago, homegrown back open again after lockdown. And this is actually our second um, event with Wealthier Network. And um, homegrown tries to bring the, together uh, the community of leaders and entrepreneurs and investors and try to build those relationships. And we feel privileged to uh, have this partnership together and looking forward to um, yeah, in September, um, have the Breakfast Club starting with the Wealthier Network um, in our club in Marlebone. Thank you very much for that, Juiced. And um, we're also very excited about um, the, the Partner Breakfast starting in September. Um, we think those will be brilliant for both Homegrown and for the Wealthy Her Network. Um, for those of you who um, don't know, um, the Wealthy Her Network is a, um, a, a network of finance, um, insurance, and legal companies, um, all collaborating to um, empower and equip women with the support and knowledge to prosper, to drive the economic advancement of women forward, and to make the financial industry fit for the future. And tonight, I'm delighted that we are being joined by um, two uh, representatives of Wealthy Hair Partners. First, we have uh, Dr. Christine Chow from Federated Hermes. And we have um, Stephanie Keller-Basma from JP Morgan Private Bank. And um, we're also joined by Deborah Gilshan of the 100% Club. And um, she is also a, um, a, a, a sustainable uh, investment <laughs> advisor. Um, and Deborah will be moderating the conversation tonight. So Wealthy Her discusses the topics that matter and that can make a tangible, tangible difference to women and for the benefit of everybody. Our research reveals that 36% of women feel that a lack of knowledge is a key barrier to taking a more active role in financial decisions, from investing in pensions to seeking legal advice and protection. And the Worthy Her Network are working with experts who are passionate about educating women. So today we're going to be talking about impact investing and have three distinguished experts, as I have just explained. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Deborah in a moment, but first of all, just to let you know, please do share any questions you have in the Q&A box. And if you'd like to send any inquiries or questions to the experts after this session, um, you can email hello at wealthyhernetwork.com and contact details for each of the speakers are also in the follow up email. And after that little bit of housekeeping, I will hand over to Deborah to set the scene. Thanks, Karina, and thank you to Wealthy Her and Home Grown House for the invitation to be part of today's discussion. Uh, a quick introduction to myself. Uh, I've been in finance and institutional investment for 20 years um, and have worked for three large investment houses. And I have extensive experience engaging with global companies on governance and sustainability issues. Through my work as a shareholder, and I now provide independent advisory services in these areas. I'm also an ambassador for the 30% Club, the global initiative to improve female representation on boards and in senior management teams. And I also run a multi-sector alliance dedicated to gender equality called the 100% Club, uh, which I founded in 2011. One of the key tenets of the 100% Club is the importance uh, of networking and the power of networking for career advancement and the professional development of women. The importance of access to networks for female entrepreneurs is particularly important. Uh, the Alison Rose Review of Female Entrepreneurship from 2019 identified lack of access to networks and other barriers that female entrepreneurs face um, in terms of getting funding. Uh, the review found that only one in three UK entrepreneurs are female, that female-led businesses are only 44% of the size of their male-led business, businesses on average, and that male uh, small and medium-sized enterprises are five times more likely to scale up to £1 million turnover than female-led SMEs, and the perceived bias within the UK venture finance community is a concern. However, it's not all bad news, um, as I read last week about Vitrex Capital, a female-led fund focused on investing in early-stage consumer startups with gender-diverse teams. 
And Victrix specifically aims to tackle the long-standing and ongoing challenges women leaders face in starting companies and have just closed their first institutional fund of $21.7 million in funding, which was oversubscribed. So this idea of using investment capital to address specific challenges in society is the theme of our panel today. A recent survey conducted by the Department of International Development highlighted that more than 70% of people in the UK wanted their own investments to achieve good for people and the planet. Investing for positive impact goes beyond avoiding harm and mitigating risks and is at the centre of a wider movement towards more responsible investing. We'll be focusing today on impact investing, which is part of a wider investment landscape, considering the impact of investing more generally. This also involves the role of companies and investors in societies and how investors hold companies to account through impactful engagement. It's being driven through a more, much more holistic consideration of environmental, social and governance factors as sources of investment risk and return, as well as heightened expectations of investors to be good stewards of companies and to hold companies to account on financial returns, but also on issues such as their supply chains, work and board diversity, uh, sorry, workforce and board diversity, executive pay and corporate culture more generally. I was listening to a podcast from the financial and wealth planning company Tilney on ESG investing, and it indicated that data from LIPR uh, sorry, Lipper highlights that there was there was thirty six billion dollars of investments in terms of inflows into ESG funds alone in the first quarter of twenty twenty, and given that that coincides with the start of the pandemic and lockdown globally, I think it's a very interesting statistic, and a lot more of their clients are now interested in where and with whom they are investing and the social repercussions of those investments. So there is a clear heightened interest across the investment chain of the sustainability of investments um, and the impact of those investments. In addition, impact investing has traditionally been funded by private capital, but the end investors that provide capital to private equity investors are often responsible investors themselves, such as large pension funds, um, and I used to work for one. And we did a lot of work with our private markets teams thinking about impact and ESG integration. Private equity houses are increasingly being required to consider the ESG impacts of their investment portfolios and often screen on various ESG factors. This will have further repercussions as to the importance of these wider investment risks and opportunities. Christine and I are both members of an organisation called the International Corporate Governance Network and we are currently debating a number of these themes around stakeholder capitalism, accountability of investors and companies, human capital, climate change and other systemic risks, as well as trust in companies and the social licence to operate. So there is an interesting circularity to all of these considerations. And today's webinar is for those who want to learn about how they can take a more active stance through investments that deliver benefits and contribute to the solutions that society needs, as well as delivering a financial return. Impact businesses and impact investors want the same thing. They both share a strong desire to see that businesses produce financial rewards and social benefits. They share the same belief that businesses will do best when they do good and have a positive social impact. So with that in mind, let's hear from the experts. So Christine, for the audience who have perhaps heard of the term impact investing, but aren't 100% certain of its meaning, let's offer some explanations. Can you give us a brief explanation of impact investing and why it's both exciting and essential? Yes, thank you. Sorry, it took me a minute to uh, just to unmute myself. Um, so I work for an organization uh, called EOS um, at uh, Federated Hermes International. So when I joined the fund management industry in 1997 as a junior analyst, I used to wonder what happens to the investment and the, and the, and the capital and the money that is being invested in the funds, because at the time, I had the opportunity to sit right next to the portfolio managers and ultimately help manage the, the portfolios. 
And I ask myself, what if the fund manager's investment ethos do not agree with mine? And I didn't know that that was called active ownership or, or stewardship. And now Federated Hermes, the organization we work for, we had one trillion US dollars of stewardship assets um, as we pioneered engagement in 1983. And how does that relate to um, impact investing? If I may ask uh, Karina to put up the, um, the first slide. Christine, sorry, just to say you've turned your video off as well. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Sorry, did you see, did you manage to see my video? We, we can see this, we can see your video now as well, great. You, you accidentally turned uh, it was off. Was it not working earlier? Uh, I think you accidentally turned it off when you turned yourself on uh, for the, uh, uh, turning from mute. <laughs> no problem. So why don't we start off with, with understanding the whole spectrum. So we identify there are six different types of categories related to sort of sustainable investment as we see it. And the idea of, of um, uh, impact investing sits right on the, on the right hand side of the fifth pillar. So where does all this come from? Actually, the idea of investing sustainably and with impact started off very early on uh, back in the 70s, for example, in the US during the time when um, there had been um, uh, uh, usually started off with ethical investors looking at avoiding certain harmful investment instruments, maybe in weapons, in the US and in the 70s as well, in Europe, there was a green movement. So the initial idea of having an impact is, please do not do harm. Let's start off with that. But over time, the um, sustainable investment movement has moved on and it has blossomed into different various options. So we can see that the second pillar is ESG integration, which means that, okay, when we look at companies, let's consider some of the environmental and social issues that they, their business will um, bring about. And then it then moves on to, why don't we look for companies and direct the capital to those who are actually having a positive impact on, 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 um, on environment, on environment and, 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 and society, which takes a screening type of approach. And then we move on to um, how about we be even more specific and invest in, say, renewable energy. So you direct capital to something very specific investment things. So here comes impact investing, in which we define it as it is a problem-solving approach to investment. It is about identifying issues that we think is going to have a negative impact on environment and society, and we actively divert capital to focus on addressing those issues. And then it comes on to, actually, at the end of all this, it is about active ownership, which is what I mentioned earlier. It, it is about feeling you have a connection to your capital and hence that your ethos, your ethos is um, uh, realized through the way you, you invest your capital. So uh, if we may move on to the next slide. So what does the future look like? I think COVID-19 has really showed us what might be the, the, um, the ESG um, factors and how it's related to, to the way we invest and how businesses are run. So for example, a lot of discussion has been around how agile uh, is, uh, has, has the company been enabling agile working? Otherwise, it's very difficult to transition to working online overnight or has the com does the company understand the supply chain? Have they been investing in the supply chain and be a, a um, responsible business uh, via uh, as a topco? So all these issues are what we consider as environmental and social. And at the same time, we feel that you know, we're going to take this to, to the next stage through, through impact investing. Um, so the numbers here is uh, for Morningstar. It's slightly different from what Deborah has uh, quoted, but uh, but both set of figures actually shows that there has definitely been more inflow into uh, impact investment funds um, and, through in, and in different regions as well. So it is not a phenomenon particularly evident in the US or UK or, or Europe. It's, it's, a, it's a global phenomenon. And, and how do we identify impact? It's actually quite difficult sometimes to think about the, um, what impact actually means. 
So um, 17 sustainable development goals were set by the United Nations back in 2015. It is sort of an enhancement and replacement of the eight millennium development goals that were set in uh, 2000. Many funds do align the impact investment goals with the SDGs, and some even measure their contribution one by one. So impact investing, I would say, is, is very exciting because who doesn't want to generate positive financial return but also do good at the same time? It's kind of something very di difficult to resist, if at all. Um, and it is very essential in a world where we live in, where there are climate change issues and more, um, and, uh, and we're also uh, talking about biodiversity concerns. They are existential concerns. So let alone the public health crisis that we've been going through and there are also many other issues, many other issues, which means there are many more opportunities for problem solving approach to investment. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks, Christine. So Stephanie, what are some of the ways in which you could invest with impact and how do you engage your clients on sustainable investing? Perfect. Thanks a lot, Deborah, and, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so I'm Steph Cat of Vesmer. I'm an investment advisor at JP Morgan Private Bank here in London, covering individuals based in the UK. When it comes to my client, they have a very different backgrounds and investment expertise, as I cover entrepreneurs, financial sponsored principals, as well as large families. And in addition to my role, I'm also the chair for the UK Female Client Strategy, which I think is, is something we all share as well on this panel, is this, this willingness to uh, also have a, a stronger uh, and larger female representation, both in terms of board, but also in the clients that we cover. So, but coming back maybe to your, to your question and to my role as a client, private client advisor, so when starting a, any conversation around investments or an investment strategy, it always starts with what are the needs, the objectives, and really the goals that our client wants to achieve. And then we can discuss together, have a strategy and think about the implementation. But this is not enough. Now there is really a willingness and more and more discussion around how do I think about my goals and objectives, but also how can I align my portfolio with my values? I mean, we've seen the stats, more and more people want to do good. Um, and so this is something that needs to be taken into consideration when we think about an investment strategy. Um, so this is where actually sustainable investing is brilliant because we can really incorporate that into the approach. So the way to do it, because as, as we discussed, is also very broad. It can mean very different things to very different people. So at GP Morgan, the way we do it is that we have four different approaches that are actually quite similar to the one that Kristen mentioned. So if I look at the first uh, one, is really about exclusionary screening. So that means you may mainly just want to exclude maybe some sectors um, or some companies from your portfolio. So think about uh, fossil fuels, weapon, tobacco, gambling. So that's where you can exclude that to your portfolio. The second way we can do it is really what we call ESG um, integration. So here, what you really wanna do is try to focus on how to incorporate some of the ESG aspects to your portfolio. So think about, we discussed it before, board composition. You wanna have companies that have a diverse board composition. A third way you can do it is what we call thematic investing. And here you will look at some companies that are very focused on one of the, the criteria. So think about solar, wind, renewable energies, electric vehicles. These are companies that would really target one of the specific aspects. And the fourth way or the fourth approach we look at is really impact investing. And here is about investing in companies, organization or funds with the intention of generating positive social um, and environmental returns alongside with uh, some of the financial returns. And here again, you can think about some of the companies, for instance, that will facilitate access to financial services in emerging markets or to underserved uh, populations. So I think that's the first aspect. And again, it's not either or, you can think about a combination of these different approaches. But then is also, and, and that's great that the space is growing, is what are the right asset class? 
because you can think about equities, fixed income, public or private markets. So again, I think the way to approach it with, with my clients or the way I think about it is really, what are your needs? What are your goals? What do you care about? And then once we have that, we put together a strategy and then we think about what is the right approach? What are the right asset class? Because I think we'll discuss it a little bit more uh, later on today, but it's not about giving up returns. It's really about having returns, but deliver it in a more meaningful way. And I have to say that, um, and again, and some of the numbers that, that Kristen showed in terms of flows and what we've been seeing is fantastic. And the space is growing. So we are still pretty much early stage, uh, but there is a solution for every need. So it, it, it is exciting. Thanks, Stephanie. I, I think this idea of um, having to jeopardize returns to make a social impact is one of the biggest uh, kind of myths, I think, around um, impact investing. So, Christine, some people obviously say you can't do good and make money at the same time. Um, is this a myth? Uh, what, what's your view on this? Well, I guess if, if, if it is something that we cannot convince investors, then the, the flows would not look as good as it, it is. Um, if I may turn to the um, presentation again, um, since we, we, we need to be make sure that we're not promoting any specific products in, at this platform, I just want to make sure that you know, the, the following examples I'm given is, is really for illustrative purposes. So um, if, if anyone's interested in any specific, um, 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 for, for specific discussions on, on what the performance looks like, I'm happy to have a, a separate conversation. But let's look at this particular theme, health and well-being. Um, it's one of the SDG theme. And I'll use this healthcare company as an example. It is a company that develops um, manufactures and distributes continuous glucose monitoring systems for diabetes management. So uh, it's, uh, it's one of the holdings in um, 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 the, the companies that we look at, look at and we look into and it's performed really, really well. And um, especially this year. And our impact thesis goes like this. So the proportion of people with type 2 diabetes is increasing in most countries, whether it's developed or or in developing countries. And the key driver of type two diabetes is obesity. And in lockdown in the past few months, I've actually shown that some people drink and eat more in developed markets, including myself, I, I have to admit. Um, and in developing markets, however, access to insulin, medical devices, and also healthcare programs that need to work together to make improvements is very, very limited. So this is a company that um, provides and, and fills the gap of this need. And we can see that um, by taking a, a problem um, uh, solving approach to, uh, to investment and to uh, directing capital, um, we, we, we're actually finding some really good and meaningful companies out there. Um, um, let's look at the next, next slide from here. So during the lockdown as well in Q2, many companies have also stopped providing certainty in, um, in, in earnings and therefore um, many of them actually refuse to. However, the companies that we cover um, in, in this particular mandate. So um, less than 25% of the companies have retracted guidance. And we believe that that's this mainly because of the fact that um, they have a very clear business model. They're solving a particular need for the society that is actually not particularly impacted by, by COVID itself, or maybe the, 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 that the readily available solution actually helps to alleviate some of the problem posted by, by, the, um, by, the, um, by, the, by the pandemic. So we feel that we, are, we, we have the right companies, we're looking at the right companies because of the fact that um, um, we are looking at companies that provide solutions to society's pressing needs and they are more resilient. And, and sometimes a good return, that's where it comes from. Getting a good return on a portfolio, sometimes it's not just about it's investing in the star um, companies. Um, because here, in this particular, in this particular example, 
we're not talking about investment in big tech uh, firms in this particular combination. Um, um, it is uh, it is to do getting a good return. Sometimes it's about uh, managing the risks and knowing the companies well, knowing that they're resilient in at a time when um, uh, the world is very uncertain. So that's just one example I want to give there. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Um, just a, re a reminder to the audience uh, to use the Q&A facility to ask questions. We're going to have a little bit of time at the end for some, for some questions. Um, so please do uh, ask anything uh, through, through the Q&A facility. So Stephanie, what should entrepreneurs think about um, in terms of ESG integration into their businesses and what are some of the resources that they can leverage, um, such as KPIs and ESG racing agencies, etc.? Yes, um, absolutely. And for having uh, worked with entrepreneur for quite uh, many years now, what is really interesting is that most of them say, perfect, I have my business, I'm successful in my business, and then maybe I set up my foundation or my charity on, on the side. And now one more the conversation is that it, it doesn't has to be either or. You can really also within your own business implement and also communicate about some of the things that, um, that are more in line with, again, your values. So I would say as investor, I'm more and more after transparency and reporting. It is actually really important. And as, as Kristen mentioned, fund managers will look at businesses where they can see this transparency, where they can see higher performance, lower volatility, better downside protection in companies that are rank, ranking high in terms of ESG priorities. So I would say for entrepreneurs, there's quite a few ways you can look at it. Uh, yes, there are a few standards and KPIs that are available that, that you can uh, absolutely decide to look at and see what are the, the criteria these agencies are looking at and how can you communicate and share what you're doing matching these criteria? So that's, I would say, is a way. Another way could be if you're looking at more private capital. Some of the private equity firms um, that we work with actually do develop their own uh, proprietary methodology on how to assess. So that's also a good way to look at what, what are they looking uh, for and what are they after. Another way is really peer-to-peer -peer comparisons, because I think we're all very mindful that a healthcare company might be very different than a fashion retailer in terms of what are some of the, the issues from an ESG point of view that they want to, um, to, to tackle. So that's another way as well to look at. There's one thing as well that we call momentum. It's all about where are you starting and what is the direction? Are you improving on some of the ESG uh, method? Because if you are a renewable company or a renewable energy company, it's easier to score better than if you are a fossil fuel company. But maybe the fossil fuel company actually does implement many more ESG initiatives. So it's about the trends and what you're starting to implement. And as I mentioned, be transparent and report about it. Because the more, tra the more transparent you are, the better it's going to be and the easier it's going to be to actually wreck what you're doing. To give you an example, for instance, that what JP Morgan decided uh, to do is now we are publishing an annual ESG and climate report, which is just an example of how we can add into our more traditional financial reports that we have to provide. How do we provide more color, more information that are not coming through our regular financial um, reports. And um, so one of the things that Kristen did mention are the United Nations um, uh, standards. So uh, they call the Sustainable Development Goals that they want to achieve by 2030. This is an easy way to just pick some of them and decide how you want to contribute that advancing some of these standards. Again, just to give you an example at JP Morgan, um, this year we decided to commit to 100 billion towards the climate change, uh, change and advancing some of this um, United Nations SDGs, as we would call them. So again, it's an easy way to just say, this is what I'm going to focus on and this is how, I mean, easy maybe, it's not easy to implement, but it's easier to pick one topic and try to stick to that. So that's, uh, that's really the way I would think about it on, on how to implement it and have it measurable. 
Great, thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so, Christine, what are the best ways for individuals to invest with impact? Um, obviously, the angel stage and venture capital requires a large risk appetite and lots of cash. Are there other ways to invest with impact uh, through investment funds, etc.? Yes. Um, so actually, I would like to share an experience of a friend of mine. She is uh, she's a tech entrepreneur herself, um, and uh, she started out in the Silicon Valley um, in the eighties, and um, with her husband, they're, they both are uh, tech entrepreneurs. And, and to start off with, they work with companies like Apple and Next, uh, founded by Steve Jobs, um, and um, um, they set up a a foundation called KL Felicitas Foundation. You can find it online and I'm sure Karina will be able to share with you because uh, I've, I've shared it, the, the information with her. Um, initially, they have a traditional portfolio, but um, over the last 10 years, they have worked very hard to transition the portfolio from, uh, from that to impact, uh, an impact investment uh, driven approach. And um, they came up with the first report in 2015 and followed by another uh, in April 20. 18. And if you look at it, you will see that um, it, there are very di different ways of, of doing impact investment. For them, there is, they have investments in public equity, there's fixed income, there's private equity, there's hedge, even hedge funds, uh, real estate and cash, even cash. Because when we think of cash, we think of putting money in a bank. Whereas for them, they, trans they, they actually look at cash being, you know, investing in community um, savings fund. So it tends to provide um, an, an attractive uh, option in terms of return, but at the same time, it directs towards a specific community to, to address their needs. So I highly recommend that you, know, you look into um, uh, uh, people interested in investment, it is possible to, to look at um, uh, this type of approach. And in that particular report, um, uh, the one I mentioned, April 2018, they have also aligned um, all the investments with the 17, uh, 17 UN development goals. So they look at how the capital has impacted the different areas of SDG. And, um, and the way they measure impact, there are many, many different organizations out there that are trying to measure impact and, um, and they follow a specific methodology it's called Impact Investment Project, uh, led by an investment project in which Federated Hermes uh, is one of the many um, advisors that so we're, we're working very hard to help investors to understand um, how they can find investment opportunities and impact and how they actually measure it as well so um, I think that there are many opportunities to to do that um, through um, a more illiquid option which is what the ones you have mentioned like through angel and 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 VC options but there are also other opportunities that look at um, existing public funds that are much more impact driven. Great, thank you. Uh, so Stephanie, how, how does one know whether an investment is impactful? Are there codes, standards, or is, is it more instinct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, good, the good thing is that it, there is more than just instinct. Um, so I think when looking at the impact an investment can have, there are definitely a few tools, but again, because it's quite broad and it will depend on the type of approach that you take or the type of asset class that you're looking at, it is important to understand what are the relevant uh, indicators. So what are we usually looking for? So you have ESG rating and scores and you have few broad uh, agencies, um, MSCI or sustainable analytics that will provide a uh, different ranking for, for, for companies where you can look at actually if an investment is done in a business how well does this business actually rank? There are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as well. And you have also other providers that are providing more niche data sets that you can look at. And here again, you can think about carbon emissions or something that is much more specific. One aspect that is also important because as we mentioned, it's about how do you uh, combine the impact with financial performance. So we look at what we call materiality of some of the ESG factors. So this is really about to look at 
how the ESG factors when integrated within a business actually do impact financial performance because some of them might be a drag on financial performance, some of them might be a boost. So this is also important to take into consideration. Um, what we do at uh, JP Morgan Private Bank is that we leverage the MSCI methodology. And what we can do as well is using this methodology is look at a portfolio uh, of a client, looking at the holdings, and we'll come up with a score. So that's a way where you can compare whether or not your portfolio is actually scoring high in terms of the impact that it's having versus a portfolio that might um, score a little bit lower. So there are uh, more and more tools. I think it's pretty much, I mean, we are still early stage, but it's really interesting to see that there are ways of measuring uh, impacts from investments. Great, thanks. Um, so this question is to, to both of you. Um, so impact investing has really evolved over time from a little understood concept to a really promising asset class. This is in part due to environmental, social and governance factors such as climate change, the COVID pandemic and political unrest being much more um, considered material to, to how we think about investing. Where do you see today the benefits and challenges with impact investing? Christine, perhaps you could go first. Thank you. Um, I think the benefits, there are um, multiple benefits. The first thing is that it is very purposeful and, and focused way of directing capital to where it needs to be. To, so that we, it's almost like the investor can set an objective of what the ideal society should look like and we are directing capital towards creating that reality. It's really empowering. Um, as, as a concept for an investor, instead of saying, let's chase the best performing stock. I mean, compared to that, which ones is more meaningful? And, um, and the benefits is also that you can finally align your own, in, your own ethos and mindset with, with, with the way you direct your, your capital. So some people really care about climate change. They want to you know, focus on directing their, their asset power to addressing those issues. Some uh, really care about plastics and, or anti-plastics. Um, some really care about water issues. I think it was Matt Damon who actually created uh, an access to water uh, initiative. Um, I've, I've read about that before. So we, we, we all have our own things that we are attached to. And now we can actually use our capital to do that. Um, also, corporate needs a purpose. I think increasingly we're hearing um, um, you know, a different investor platform that talks about an urgent company say every corporate need, needs a business purpose. And that aligns very well between the investor direction and also what corporates should be doing. And um, all benefits will come not without the, the challenges as well. I would say that the challenges, um, um, the first of all, is, is actually impact washing. It's almost like greenwashing. There are a lot of discussion about impact, but not really everyone is able to deliver. We all have to prove ourselves continuously. So maybe that's a good challenge as well. Um, also relevant metrics for measurement that people can understand. What does it mean? It's, it's, it's impacting more people better or, or have a deeper impact, more important. And these are constant challenges that we have to have to deal with. And I'll, I'll finish with one example. It's a very well-known one. It's called it's, uh, Tom's Shoes, you probably heard of Tom's Shoes. Um, they started as a, um, uh, as a social enterprise that um, promised that um, for every pair of uh, shoes that are made or, or purchased by um, uh, customers, they will give another pair of shoes to, to people with, with, with no shoes in the developed or you know, frontier markets. And then over time, this business, this business actually found out that by giving out shoes for free, which is a good thing for those who don't who need it, um, it actually um, um, uh, completely killed the local shoe business. So what they did was that they did a complete reassessment of the impact of well, of their good intention, and then decided that actually if they were going to make a pair of shoes uh, as a, as a one-for-one one kind, uh, kind of, um, of, of a model, um, they create new jobs in a very targeted area where they believe it might be impacting. So they don't just um, uh, donate a pair of shoes made in um, Brazil or made in Italy to, to, to people who, who might be living in um, Sierra Leone. They actually 
started creating shoe business in, in, in those markets. So um, I, I would finish off with the challenges, understanding that even though sometimes we started out as wanting to create good impact, there are unintended consequences. So um, uh, uh, whether it's an a, uh, a, a intelligent entrepreneur, intelligent investor or, or intelligent business should think about the fact that sometimes what we set out to do might, might lead to very different outcomes and it's good to be able to observe that. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Stephanie, do you have anything uh, from your perspective on, on, on that question as well? Yeah, sure. So I think, uh, and actually it is quite interesting because when we think about uh, as investment advisor, we'll think about what is the new trade idea, what is the new investment idea, what are the mega trends? And uh, in a pre-COVID world, uh, we, we had identified um, three mega trends, which are digital transformation, healthcare innovation, and sustainability. And what we've seen with the COVID situation situation is that as much as we are, we keep saying the world is completely changed and has changed forever. Actually, if anything, we think these mega trends will continue and accelerate. So one of the, the, the benefits of having a bigger sustainable investing space, and we've seen there are more and more flows uh, coming into the space, no matter how volatile the market might have been over the past couple of months, investors have been putting more capital to work towards um, sustainable investing solutions. So I think we really see the benefit from uh, a better, better performance, both on the downside and on the upside of um, sustainable in investments. And this is really interesting because one of the big pushback that we keep hearing is, yeah, yeah, it's good. It protects you on the downside because it's a company with high quality focus, it excludes some of the more punchy sectors um, like energy. But actually on the rally we've seen on the market, these strategies and these companies have just proven to be more resilient. So I think there is a true benefit from a, from a asset allocation and, and, uh, and portfolio construction. And that of course, uh, is almost nothing against aligning values where money is invested. So I think that's also really another um, benefit. And the fact that the space is growing, and it's growing much faster than the rest. So if I give you an example, so clean energy's earnings are projected to grow 17% between 2019 and 2022. I mean, there are not that many sectors where we expect such a growth um, in earnings, uh, for instance. Or, um, and, and really something that we see will, will continue and is also thinking about engaging the new generation. We've seen in some survey, 80% of millennials actually think that ESG is key for them. Um, and then I think from a government point of view, uh, and again, coming back to the COVID world, it just has allowed them to accelerate some of the initiatives um, that they had. And I'll give you an example. So I, I'm from Switzerland. And it's been years they've been trying to put some bikes uh, lane everywhere. And they always got opposition and it was never feasible. And now everywhere you have bikes lane that are much bigger, they close some roads. And, and people are saying they just did it overnight, saying, yeah, yeah, it's COVID now, people need to be on bikes. And people are saying, no one voted on that. It just has been implemented. So I think it is, it is a big benefit and something that just like continues um, growing but um another benefit that is not so much sustainable investing per se but i think it's about the raise uh, awareness that is much higher now about some of these issues is if we think about pollution levels i think at the, the heights of, of of covid earlier on this year we were back to 2006 uh, pollution levels so people are just realizing that there is there is a way of tackling issues, probably not putting all economies in, in, in lockdowns, but being more mindful of, of some of these priorities. Uh, so I would say in terms of like the challenges, I think as lockdowns are easing, it will be difficult to continue pushing some of these initiatives. Um, but I think the benefits are, are clean, clearly there. And then about the yeah, impact washing or greenwashing. I think just be careful as something becomes more trendy you have more and more people coming there so again work with some expert or find your trusted advisor that can help you navigate um, and really look through what is actually really impactful versus what uh, is just an impactful label great thank you um 
So Christine, companies are under pressure to address profligate plastics use um, as environmental degradation mounts, public sentiment shifts, policymakers respond to calls for actions. How can investors spur change in sectors such as consumer goods, retail and chemicals? So um, at Federated Hermes, we've always been quite vocal about what we like to see in terms of changes with companies. And we're doing more and more investor expectations type document, and this is one of them. So we, we can go to that one last slide that I have. Um, I think COVID has, has, has brought um, 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 positive changes, um, like Stephanie was talking about with the, with the cycling lanes. I like that a lot. Um, but it also bring challenges, because we are, um, and, and, and there are two of those. Well, plastics is one of them. The other is actually um, a, a lot of uh, a women who are, um, uh, probably working women, if, um, if the, the, there is a strong expectations in a particular society that, that women should look after children and if there are no schools, um, I think we, are, we might be seeing a big U-turn of women empowerment um, as, the, as the lockdown, uh, as the pandemic continues. So I hope that doesn't. But going back to global plastics challenges, in April uh, this year, we published a 20-page report uh, which is available online as well. You can see there with the, the link um, on the same slide, um, where we set out what are the uh, main issues of the um, problems of, of, uh, of global plastics. And we set out also um, seven areas. On the left, you can see the, 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 the navy blue um, in different areas covering product and packaging, uh, research and development, design and innovation, sourcing, procurement, customer life cycle management. So basically the whole process of um, how different sectors use plastic from input to um, uh, the, um, the way they do packaging and, and collection. And, and, and we have done a, a sector by sector approach and advice on how companies can actually uh, participate in addressing the global plastics challenges. So going back to you know, your, your question on how can investors spur change, have, I would say we, we need to have a very clear idea as to what are the causes of, of the problem we have identified and what are the different stages. Can we break down the problem into different stages? Because we can't address one big problem at the same time. We need to know where it comes from, which part is more important in which sector, and how can we work with the companies to address those? Because there's, it's very easy to, to bash the companies on the head and say that, no, you need to change this. But how? If we do not give them some suggestions or recommendations and we work through the challenges together, we're just someone making a lot of noise. So we don't want to do that. We want to be responsible. Then we need to contribute to it. So, um, so this is what we have, and that is widely available. So feel free to, to take a look uh, if, you, if you are um, uh, interested. Great, thanks, Christine. I, I'm going to ask Stephanie one uh, last question, and then we're, I'm going to take some Q and A from the the audience because we've got some great questions coming through. So, Stephanie, what are some of the solutions available, and how have you seen the industry change in regard to product offering that is available in sustainable investing? Sure, I absolutely. So, as I mentioned, it's really uh, it's been a space that has been growing in a, I mean, in a quite fascinating matter in terms of solutions that are available, uh, assets that are going in that direction and across uh, all uh, asset classes. If you just look at what we have um, uh, in the private bank, we have more I mean, close to 100 solutions for our clients to invest in. So I think the, the choice and the, the, the solutions are here. Um, so really what is key is find what are your objectives. Always start with your objectives, what you want to achieve, what are your values? And then it's about identifying, because the solution I hear, what is right for you? Is it the private market? Will it be the public market? Do you want to build a portfolio of, of single companies where you will go and, and choose the companies? Or do you want to go with a manager? But again, if you go with a manager, make sure you know what this manager is doing and, and you can get the transparency, you can get the information of what the values are. Because I think as discussed more and more, people ask for that and we say, but what are you doing? How many women do you have working for you? How many minority people do you have working for you? 
but really like how come um you're saying that you focus on, on companies so how do you measure that so as we're getting more and more uh i would say demands from investor we are seeing more and more supply as well from from managers and funds um, providers and one way i've seen the industry changing which is quite interesting or at least in in the way we do due diligence on the managers that we work with we always had the four p which is people performance process and performance and now guess what we added the fifth one it's purpose what is your purpose what are you doing so it is really in the industry it has been changing and and then more and more this is something that is growing and the way i can see it forward is that it's not going to be a, an addition that you might find but it's just going to be completely embedded in the in the way we think about investments okay great so i'm going to take some questions from the audience now so the first one is on criteria for assessment um and one of the audience members um points to the eu sustainable finance taxonomy which was adopted last month by the european parliament which enables more concrete guidance around ESG and impact investing. Um, so do either Christine or, um, oh, sorry, do you have views specifically on the taxonomy from the EU? Christine, do you want to see that? Yeah, yeah happy to, to take that one. Actually, that uh, taxonomy has been available um, as, a, as a review for since 18th of June last year. Because I, 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 I definitely remember that day because actually three documents came up on the, on the same day. And um, I think that the um, taxonomy is extremely important um, because of the fact that it can um, actually define uh, what is considered as, say, a green activity. And even for something like carbon capture, for example, there's been a lot of discussion about is, is carbon capture good? Does it actually encourage more emissions? Um, so there's been a lot of debate about this and the EU taxonomy has enabled that debate to be much clearer and it also forms a blueprint for other countries and markets to use that as, um, as a guidance and a reference to create their own version of taxonomy. Uh, at least for my understanding, I understand that Japan or China are all using that as a reference and coming up with something similar. So extremely important as a guidance and I think it, it would only be um, you will see that uh, the, the application and use of the taxonomy in a wide range of different investment products. So to help people to understand, you know, what is categorized as green, how do you measure it, who do it. The, 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 the document is, is really thick. I think I, I forgot how many hundreds of pages there. But for every activity, it listed out um, the criteria, who is doing it, who measures it. So it's a very detailed document, um, uh, a lot of hard work for, for, for many, many experts there who participate. Yeah. Um, and maybe just on... that, I think something that is quite interesting is that Europe is really leading the way in terms of sustainable investing initiatives or sustainable uh, uh, initiatives in general. And, and we can see it with, I mean, just talking in general in Europe, people are just really more sensitive and investors in the US or in Asia are relatively newer. So I think they really look up to Europe and, and the EU what is implemented. So that's another reason why I think this taxonomy is really important. Sure, we had a question on greenwashing, but I think we've, we've covered that in, in your comments. I'm going to combine two questions from one of the participants. Uh, just very briefly, she said she's struggling to find funds containing genuinely ethical companies. Uh, where can I find funds that make a real difference? Um, you know, are, are ethical funds just a cursory nod to something less damaging rather than being genuinely regenerative and is it too expensive for a fund manager to assess the genuine impact of companies? I think there's a common theme through through all of that and it's about definitions as well but perhaps again maybe start with Christine and, and Stephanie you can join join as well. Sure um, when it comes to how you def anyone defines ethical it could vary between, between individuals and even institutions as well. So I think you really need to, fo to follow your own intuition and do your own due diligence and say, what is acceptable to me as a standard? And um, if, if, if the managers cannot provide you with enough evidence uh, or transparency, because we ask, the fund managers ask companies to be transparent and they themselves need to be transparent as well. And this is essentially the spirit of the stewardship code in the UK in 2020 is that um, uh, the the uh, the fund managers need to be responsible and hold, hold accountable 
to the beneficiaries, which are the ones who actually own the capital. So I, I would suggest that instead of relying on specific uh, ratings that are being used by the managers, ask them, ask them how do they do it, rather than saying, which rating do you use? That's only one part. That is only one way of uh, and how, uh, improving the efficiency of assessment. But that's not the only stage of assessment. Otherwise, uh, you know, basically we're, we're talking about a, a, a pass, also almost a passive screen instrument. Um, impact is, it, it is about having um, in, intentional effort to look into it. So for uh, a company you've mentioned here, um, there might be a, some supply chain issue, human rights issue in the supply chain. And, um, and I think that it's, it's, um, it's any asset owner, individual, not just institutional asset owner, beneficiaries, what we call, however, what, 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 what we, we call them, or call we, what we call us, we should question the fund managers and say, have you looked into the supply chain? What have you done to do that? So, 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 so I think that that's uh, one good way of doing it. Do question your fund managers. And if they say that you're too small a retail investor to, uh, to talk to, um, there are in, in retail investment uh, investor association and there are many different platforms in which that you, know, you can voice your concern. Thank you. And Stephanie, do you have anything to add on that one? Yeah. I, I, I would say uh, a good way, I mean, it can be quite overwhelming because there are a lot of solutions difficult. So if you have a financial partner, I would say definitely ask them because they should be able to, to, to help you as well, leveraging their due diligence uh, team, or I'm sure the Wealthy Her Network also can, can, can help. Another way, I would say just go on the webpage um, and the website on some of the fund managers, because usually it's a good way to see what, what are they actually putting on the website? How is their team uh, built? And are they really, when you read what they're saying, is it really reflected in, in what you can see there? So there are two ways, but uh, definitely I would say a trusted advisor or uh, also look at the resources that, that are available through uh, some of the other schemes. Thank you. And, and Christine mentioned the new stewardship code here in the UK, and I, I do believe that's going to be much more um, impactful in terms of looking at the impact of all types of investors, um, including uh, impact investors as well. Um, I'm going to close there because we were, we're really on time and we've covered many of the questions, but there were a few more. So I apologise for that. Um, so uh, back to Karina from the Wealthy Heart Network to, to close us and thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah, Stephanie and Christine. It's been an absolutely fascinating chat. And if anyone has any questions that they haven't um, thought about or haven't been answered, um, all the contact details for, <clears throat> excuse me, both the Wealthy Her Network and all of the speakers are going to be in the follow-up email um, that will be sent to you tomorrow. So feel free to get in touch with any of us. Um, thank you to Homegrown as well for hosting us tonight. And um, yeah, uh, just to one last thing actually, um, as Dr. Christine said earlier, um, all of the comments said, um, or, or delivered during this webinar are just very general. Um, if you would like specific advice, please do get in touch with um, either Stephanie, Deborah or, or Christine, they will be happy to help you. Thank you very much. And Thank on you. that note, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.